Hey, Miguel. Hello, Venerable. It's such a such a long time I haven't seen you. Yeah. Yeah, we share so much uh, good and bad memories. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and uh, you you look good. You look very good, actually. Really? Um, yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's the Korean fruits. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, my name is Miguel, and um, I'm from Portugal. What? <laughs> which is uh, if you go to a map, if you go to Europe, is the uh, yes. next to Spain. Exactly. Yeah. For me, they have more of these region things where they have like Catalonia and Valencia and the mm, Basque country. That's and true. They have like a, a subcultures. For me, it's more uh, obvious. Um, so maybe we can introduce shortly um, what uh, interested you to go to Roma. Mm -hmm. So um, I have um, African and Asian roots. Yeah, and and mm. uh, when I was in college, I started looking up uh, um, into Chinese martial arts. So I oh, you're Kung the Kung Fu man, right? I <laughs> yeah. remember, yeah. I, I learned Kung Fu and Qigong. Yeah. And my Qigong teacher was uh, quite impressive, <clears throat> but he never uh, teaches meditation. And we, we say that we have like um, uh, three pillars on the on the Kung Fu. We have a, a Kung Fu with martial art, we have a, a Qigong, with the energy part, and you have a meditation, which is the mind part. But he never wanted to uh, teach meditation, teach yeah, because he said it's too dangerous. He told really? Some, yeah, I, he, I feel he, like Kung Fu is a lot more dangerous, like, yeah, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, he used to tell a story where he was practicing meditation. And once, he, one time he went to the bank and he started uh, um, think, uh, sending thoughts to some person that was working, saying like, get up. And the person would get up and he said, no walk. Walk ten, ten step forward, and the person would walk. Now, tie your shoelaces, and the person would tie the shoelaces. So he said, "Okay, this is too dangerous. I, I don't want to teach this." Yeah. Mm. But but he, he, I asked him one time uh, if he recommended any uh, Buddhist texts because mm. uh, my Chinese master was, had a great connection with Buddhism. <clears throat> he sometimes he would introduce some Buddhist concepts, and he. Apparently, he had some affinities with the uh, Guanyin Bodhisattva. So he recommended that. I didn't know anything about Buddhism. And I searched a little bit. I read the Vajra Sutra. No, yeah, the Vajra Sutra and the Sixth Patriarch Sutra. Mm. And I found the, the commentary by Venerable Master Xuan Hua. Wow, out of all and these started, things. Yeah, I started reading and it was amazing. It was really, really good. You're so lucky. Thought, you okay, just wanted... like straightforward, you go to the, the best one. You know? Yeah, and then I said, <laughs> at the time I had a friend, uh, Bruno, you remember Bruno? Yeah. Yeah, Bruno was also into meditation with a different style. He went to India and whatever. And he asked me, why don't you learn meditation if it's important for your Kung Fu? And I, and I said, when I learned something, I went to learn with the best. I don't want to waste time because uh, there's a lot of crap. Mm. It's very, very hard to know what's good and what's not good. Right, so, right. When you're a beginner, you don't know what's the best. Yeah, even even if you're a master, you don't know because you're people right. don't talk about these things, and it's very hard to judge. Compare, yeah, to judge one with another, and if your skill is low, you're you're stupid, right? You don't know. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I um, I looked up and I said, okay, I want to learn with this master, but I found out Master Fen Hua was there. Oh no, <laughs> a little bit too late. Okay, let, let's see who's still uh, uh, teaching under who's the like successor or whatever. And I sent two emails. I found the Medicine Master uh, Sutra commentary by Master Yonghua. So I knew he had a temple in LA. And, and I found the CTTV website, City of 10,000 Buddhists. And I knew they had a temple also, a big, at least one, a big one. So I sent two emails around the September or November, I don't remember. And I don't know why, but only uh, Master Young Hua replied and he, he said, okay, just come on over. Uh, you know why? We're so smart at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember when you came, it was literally empty. I thought to myself, okay, so I, I know Kung Fu and it's hard. And sometimes it's tiring, but I can do it. And I thought it was like, if I went to yoga class or, or whatever, it would be the same kind of experience. 
but I already knew about the schedule. I knew it was demanding, but in my mind, it, it was physically demanding. So I was young and I was uh, uh, physically able. So I thought, okay, I'll go and, and, and whatever. It will be tough, <laughs> but we'll see. <laughs> okay, so th then, yeah, I bought, bought the plane ticket. I, I knew no one. I went straight to the temple out of the airport, got a taxi, a uh, 24 hour or something uh, flight. I had to catch two flights and I arrived a bit tired, right? Around 10 or 11 in the night. So Venerable uh, Sienje uh, greets me and we started chatting and he asks me, okay, so have you practiced meditation? <laughs> and I said, no, <laughs> never. So can I, can I see how you sit? And I sat on the floor and I, I tried to do half lotus and my leg was like, uh, Really, really oh bad. no! <laughs> and he makes this face. Hmm. <laughs> okay. And then I ask, okay, so the seats start at two a.m. It's around eleven or midnight. So should I go to bed or rest some hours and come like after breakfast or something? And he says, no, no, it's okay. If you're tired, there's no problem. Just wake up at two thirty and do whatever people are. Doing. And then uh, two months. So it was Master Yonghua. Venerable Qian Qi and Qian Jie, mm -hmm. and then maybe two or three persons during the week. At the weekends, a bit more, but during the week. Is the two people including me? <laughs> yeah, maybe three or four, okay, but not, not <laughs> much more than that. I don't count. <laughs> no, because I'm thinking about like, the, because the day starts really early, right? Oh, at that time I'm sleeping. <laughs> yeah, at, at that time people were working or, or sleeping or whatever, but for me, when you start practicing at 3 a.m., when you, you arrive at, you get at noon, you get it's already like a whole day almost, right? So the, the, the idea, the impression I had is was, was like most of the time, it was almost no one. And then after 5 or 6 p.m., people come after work and, and then you see like a bit some, more people. Some people are listening to Dharma talks. Yeah, but most of the day, like the, from 3 a.m. to 5, almost no one, like. And, and, and worse, because they weren't used to have like outside people and, and when you meditate, sometimes people don't really want to talk, you know. So between the, the sits, I had nothing to, to talk, no one to talk to <laughs> until you arrived. <laughs> so it was, I remember I was in the kitchen, just me and some other person just sitting there. I was looking at the clock, maybe 4 a.m. and I was thinking, what am I doing here? <laughs> was the uh, first time was very, very hard. Yeah. Okay, you, you confess remember? now to the audience. You came for a whole week and then within two or three days you ran off or something, I <laughs> remember. The third day I ran off, yeah. Oh, the third day. You, you know, I remember till now, you know, I tried to encourage you not to leave. So I was putting extra efforts to talk to you. And then one, one time I came to the temple and they said, he just went away. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> he disappeared. <laughs> because I clearly remember you promised me you're not going to leave. You promised me, don't worry, I'm not leaving. And then you just disappeared. <laughs> I go to a temple on the other continent where, I, where nobody knows me. I, even if they know me, they, they don't really want to talk. And if you don't have a car, there's nothing really to do. And I was just there by myself. I looked one side and other side but I see no one. <laughs> there's nothing yeah so i said okay this is like a prison i felt like i was in prison and when everybody was meditating i sneaked out i snuck out <laughs> i called the taxi <laughs> and, and went to the airport yeah maybe five years you started right mm -hmm. yeah so how do you think you evolved in, i i have to be honest so in the beginning I, I think I made a lot of progress um, and um, okay, so I, I, can, I can divide my progress in two parts, before my son was born and after he, he was born. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so when, when you came to the Lu Mountain Temple back in 2016 and then you came back the next year because you realized you made a mistake, you wanted to learn something more, so you came back. I remember. Yeah. You so know the second time was better. You brought your friends. Yeah. Maybe. Were you alone no, or brought time. your friends? Third time. I third time. Or oh, the second time you came by yourself. Yeah. 
I came because I saw something. You don't know it's there. Yeah. yeah. And people were very respectful of the master. I remember master was uh, during the Dharma talk. He was saying, okay, so if you, if you don't want to sit, you, you, you can bow. And he said to everyone, okay, you should bow. He start bowing at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. Just go and bow one hour, two hours. So it's saying, either... It's either everybody in that room is crazy, that's only two or three people, <laughs> or there's something good. <laughs> But I remember, I, I have this image in my mind where you have like the monks and you have like 60 year old uh, ladies. Everybody was bowing at 3 a.m. In, in, yeah. in the morning. Whether, whether all these people are crazy or there's something, some good yeah. reason for them to do it. Exactly. And, and I said, I, at the time I, I understood, okay, so, This is something is going on here and, and okay, I'm, I'm going away, but that stuck in my mind. And I was having a very hard time and, and I was crying when he was talking to me because I was very stressed. And um, he said, he, I, I practiced Kung Fu for 10 years and internal Qigong and whatever. And he said to me, okay, you, are, you don't have any Samadhi. <laughs> you have zero Samadhi. And oh, I was very, no. very upset yeah, at that time. I was very, very upset. And then I, I'm, I, I got a bit angry and I said, mm, <laughs> I'll, I'll come back. <laughs> and, oh, and that's why you come back. Master knows how to push a <laughs> button. <laughs> maybe, maybe. So yeah, I, I went home and I started practicing half lotus every day. And I, I continued reading about the Venerable Master Xuanhua and Master Yonghua. I think I sent him an email before I went to the temple and he said I should bow like 30 minutes a day and I continued mm. bowing, which was very good. And then I, I, I decided I wanted to take refuge and that's why I came back the second time in May. Oh, to so, take ref refuge. Yeah. To, oh, that's uh, a, a big thing. Yeah. Because, you know, now I left home life. I see from the other side, I see so many people change from taking refuge. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's like a magic. You, they just come, woo, and they come and they take refuge and they're like different people. I don't know how that works, but I see the changes. It's weird. <laughs> so yeah, anyway. In terms, in terms of progress, uh, well, uh, in, the, in the first couple of years, I, I think I made good progress and at, at, at uh, lots, lots of different levels. So. One of one of uh, one of the example I can give is uh, Gida, my girlfriend. She notices that when I come back from the Chanchi, especially, she notices I I I I come a little bit different. So she always encourages me to go, even now that we have to to have two sons, right? And it's a bit more stressful for her to take care of the of the kids when I'm away. Even now, she says that I should go anyway because it's very good for me. So mm -hmm. I'm. She's a very good indicator that I'm doing something right. I notice a lot of changes in myself, but it's more like uh, if I practice, I notice I, I'm much more calmer and focused and detached for some things. And if I don't practice, I, I know it's something's missing. This, this was obvious to me with the Qigong practice, and it's very, very obvious to me with the meditation practice. That's what yeah, you're saying. Was, was, was okay, but this is, this is deeper. This is, um, mm. so the, what I see now, and, and if my uh, Qigong friends are seeing, they, they, they will have to forgive me. <laughs> but Qigong for me is like uh, doing sports, okay? So if you go to the gym, you, your body gets healthier, right? Physically. If you practice Qigong or, or internal martial arts, your energy uh, gets better. But that doesn't necessarily makes you a better person because you, you can have a lot of energy and use that energy to do stupid things or, 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 or use it not so wisely. But if you practice meditation and, or if you cultivate, not only meditation. But no, cultivate, not just meditation, it's the Dharma talks. Yeah. yeah. Because master you, teach you to, the, to, to go to the right direction. I exactly. think it's very important. Yeah, so if you, if you do the right things under a, a good master, you will become a better person. I mean, you, or even if you just listen to the Dharma talks, you don't you, even need to, yeah. It, it, over time, it... it yeah, I think you good. somehow change your perspectives about things. 
that you see. Yeah, yeah. Life. And and uh, when I practice qigong, I, I really liked my old qigong school and kung fu, and I really enjoyed uh, having that time with my uh, friends. But it's 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 not complete, you know. It doesn't necessarily make you a good person. What happens is most people that that search for those kind of things, they already have like some goodness in them, right? Mm. Because they it's not like a very violent martial art. You practice more for health benefits, so they are they are already like a calmer person. But it has a limit. And if you practice uh, meditation and and if you cultivate, uh, it has no limit. The limit is yourself, is is what you can do by your practice. Because whatever I put in the practice, it's what I what, what I bring out. And that didn't happen with Qigong. With, with Qigong, I hit a limit. I don't know if it was because of me or my master or whatever. I hit a limit and it was very hard to go over it. Mm. And with, with this practice, with cultivation, and meditation, if you put a bit of effort, you, you, you get a bit out. If you put a lot of effort, you get a lot out and, and, and so on. The more you put, it's the, the more you, you get out and, and the harder it becomes too. <laughs> but with cultivation, I feel that what you put is what you get. Mm. Simple as that, yeah. And then it's... it's uh, uh, can you uh, tell people what you do for a living, please? Sure. Uh, I'm a computer uh, programmer. I'm an engineer, and I work for uh, currently. I work for a Swiss company. So you say uh, that's a, a job that in your country people will uh, be impressed. Uh, yes, I'm. I'm. I, I'm very bad at self marketing, <laughs> but yes, I would say so. Yeah. Mm, that's considered to be a good job. What I, that's what I meant. Yeah, it's in your considered country. to be a good job. Yeah. Very good job, actually. Yeah. Mm. How did the meditation improve your performance at work? I'm, I'm sure it did. First of all, I'm pretty sure. What what helped me the most was uh, to to lately to cut off my ambition to become a bit detached from from work. So when I graduated, it was around 2006, uh, Google and, and Amazon, whatever, these big companies were not as big as they are today. They were very small companies, I guess. Uh, but now um, I see a lot of uh, person, uh, people coming out of college and going straight to these- uh, Big companies. Big companies earning a lot of money. And, and of course I get jealous, right? Because I feel I missed the, the time frame for doing these kind of things. I have friends mm -hmm. that went to from Portugal to San Francisco, New York, and, and, and want to, to, to get some ambition. So I want to move to always a better job, a better job, uh, more money and whatever. And uh, at some point I decided uh, this never ends, right? So I have to become happy with what I have. And I enjoy my company very much. It's a very good company and I enjoy my colleagues and they pay me more than what I need for, for my expenses. And I think meditation helped me to cut off the ambition to always want something better. You know? mm. Maybe it, that's, yeah. that's, uh, that's what we should learn because you know, at a certain point I had that experience too because my business was growing so fast and uh, I couldn't understand what is the best balance between my personal life, cultivation life and the business life. Because you know we have this type of momentum. You want to go forward and get you know richer and wealthier and you know more successful. And then you sort of like uh, reduce your cultivation and personal life, and then eventually you become a slave of this success, so-called success. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's successful, but mm -hmm. and I remember Master say, "Where are you going?" I said, "Well, I need to go to my job." And then he said, what's your job? I said, to make more money. And then he just laughed at me. I said, oh, wow, you know, what am I doing? <laughs> Why am I saying this? It's so yeah. embarrassing. And you then I, right? yeah, like something hit my head. And I said, well, you know what? That is a very stupid thing to think. <laughs> so I sort of, at the time, I realized 
that's kind of like a pursuing a empty, empty goal because you don't know why you're making the money and there's no balance. So I uh, sort of slowed down and I think that was a good choice because, um, you know, I see a lot of my friends in business world, they are so stressful. They cannot enjoy their own money either. And they cannot enjoy their family either, you know. So maybe at this time, you have to beautiful son, you know, beloved wife, you know, stable, um, stable life. I think Portugal is a very good place to live like that. It is, yeah. Yeah, it's actually, very you're very blessed. So, yeah, what people, yeah, you were very successful. You, uh, one thing that, that caused an impression on me is that you were so successful that you didn't even need to work, right? Because you were always around the temple and, and just... yeah, at a certain point, I, I yeah. didn't, I just check my email and go to the temple every day. I remember. Yeah. So I, 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 I was, um, I mean, some people would say that you, you leaving the home life was a natural progression, but still, I think it was, uh, I was happy to see that you just moved, uh, to the next thing that, that to fulfill you, right? So it, 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 it's made me um, realize what matters to me. And for, to, to me, maybe because I missed the time frame, I don't know, but I realized that uh, I, I would have at some point to cut my ambition. No, so, I think actually that's a very good choice. You know why? Because I remember at a certain point I went to Seattle and open a meditation class and there are people who work for Amazon, you know, there are people from, and I did some classes in San Jose. There were a ex -co ex worker from, I think Tesla, I think all these high tech mm -hmm. companies. I think I heard that they say that their, uh, their work lifespan is so short. Every year or two, they move around and they have so much pressure. Uh, they were not happy to my eyes. They were so stressful. They constantly have to think of what other job they have to take or how to better themselves for their work. You know, then they cannot have a stable family. They always worry. I don't know if that is, that is what, you know, life is about to me. I heard from somewhere, if you're a programmer in the United States, you can always find a job. Yeah, almost everywhere, not only in the U.S., I mean, almost everywhere. everywhere. I was pretty successful in business and I have a big house. I never get to enjoy my house. I was too busy here mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. so much pressure every day to survive in the industry, in the field. Mm -hmm. So actually, you know, people should be jealous of your life. You... Lisbon is a beautiful place to live. Yeah, I feel very blessed for sure. And you know, one thing also that I uh, remember, uh, people in Portugal are different. They are not as poisoned <laughs> like the Americans or the Koreans. I feel they are more pure because I don't know if this will be communicated correctly, but uh, the fact is uh, Portugal, has a lower income country, is a lower income country. But I feel like I always felt that, you know, we always pursue high tech, you know, more economy and all these things. It's actually ruining our essence because we always look for outside. But when I went to the, went to Lisbon, it was a very special experience because like I see how between the friends you have, you really care. Mm -hmm. but it's very hard to see that anymore in any other countries even in korea or in america you know people just think of themselves nowadays because it's so stressful the idea i have for from the times i was in america is that it's a very uh, demanding culture so everybody is pushed to to be successful right they they have to be successful and have a good job and so on. And over here, I mean, people, some people realized that even if they work a lot, they will never be, they will never have a lot of money or so. And, and then they just become more detached from, from, 
that part of life, you know. Yeah, you just uh, surrender, <laughs> and then you, <laughs> exactly. and yeah, then and you're just happy, like oh, it's okay, it doesn't matter, yeah. it's not my and, problem and, anymore. <laughs> and we have some some other things that are nice too. So because the weather is good, it's like actually I think California. Yeah, weather. You know, I remember the weather was so excellent. Yeah, and the food is good, so people they normally tend to. Uh, connect more uh, over the weather and the food. So they have these big meals, like uh, especially on the weekends, yeah, and, uh, family meal and so on. Actually, you know, you those people living in the Seattle or the Bay Area, I'm sure they don't eat as good as you do. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, the food here or in America is too engineered. Mm -hmm. It's not natural anymore. Uh, it doesn't matter how rich you are. There's, it's, there's, there's no availability of those food you can experience in Portugal. They say the same. The food here is, uh, is very, 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 especially if it's you're not- very natural, yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially if you eat fish. <laughs> yeah. so, oh, no, I miss it. <laughs> I missed yeah, it. <laughs> I was already vegetarian. <laughs> yeah. So sad. Even when I went to Spain, you know, twice. I mean, not twice, one time in Spain and one time in Monaco and Nice in France, I was already vegetarian. Can you believe it? <laughs> so sad. Maybe next lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> I miss all this good wine from Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the wine is good too. Uh, <laughs> so sad. <laughs> yeah. What I noticed is that uh, after a while, I, I, I'm not so sure about uh, if I'm going in the right direction. Because of the pandemic, I haven't been at the temple for a couple of years now, uh, more than two years, I think. And uh, because my life is a bit more busy because of the kids, right? It's harder for me to get like a consistent schedule. So in the beginning, I would sit every day and just meditate as much as I could. And now, because my practice is not as consistent, um, I feel like I, I hit like a, a, a block. And I, I need some extra help to, want to, to continue. I do, but not as much as, as I would like. So, so because uh, sometimes I, I, I don't have, I have to take care of the kids and we have to, stuff to do. Yeah, because they are here to take their, uh, you, they're your creditors probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. You need to pay back first. <laughs> daddy, daddy, you serve me. <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> Daddy, daddy. <laughs> you know what you should do? You should listen to more Dharma talks. Yeah, I try to do that because too, sometimes... if, if you can sit enough of the time when you are at home, just play the MP3 as much mm -hmm. as you can. You don't have to pay attention. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing that I did the right, I did, I did right is I listened to a lot of Dharma talks. You know, Master's right, it's like a planting seeds. Because I remember when I came to Korea in 2016 and 17, I went up to one another level each time. When master is not there, I was in Korea by myself. And you know why? You know why? Because I'm so brainwashed by his Dharma talks. <laughs> Whatever I do, it follows me around. <laughs> it's like master, like... Uh, uh, personalized master right here. <laughs> mm. So I think maybe you should listen to more, more Dharma talks because with the two kids and job and the family and all this engagement. And uh, another thing I noticed about progress, we're talking about progress is every time I went back to the temple, so I, I think I, I, I went there maybe seven times or so, I don't remember. And I always brought people and so on. But every time I went back, I noticed people were different. And especially in the last two, three times, I noticed they, for me, they, it felt like they, they progressed a lot, everybody, when I went to the temple. 